This is French polishing. You see a white streak behind this pad when it gets rubbed on the guitar. Shellac is, uh, the solvent for shellac is alcohol. So there's shellac and alcohol and oil on this pad. And when you pass the pad over the surface of the wood, over the finish, the alcohol comes out, the oil smooths the path, and the shellac gets evenly spread onto the work surface, the shellac film, and the alcohol evaporates. And that vapor trail that you see, that trail you see is the alcohol evaporating. Watch. At my angle, I can see it. I'll bring it down here by that spot. You see it? So what you do is like big figure eights. And every time you do a figure eight, you touch the edge. So if you take care of the edges, the middle takes care of itself. But you can see the evaporation see that trail and I'm not putting very much pressure on it so to French polish a guitar you do this process of um, passing this pad over the top of the guitar for quite a few hours and you get a glassy finish it's a little tricky. It takes a while to get the hang of it. It's not quite straightforward and the shellac can, and the alcohol and the wood, sometimes they can be um, particular and they don't cooperate. So you have to figure out ways to outsmart the materials. But you can't force these materials. They only work if you work at a very, uh, slow pace. You can't just do this fast because you see the alcohol is evaporating. You can kind of only do this as fast as the alcohol is going to evaporate. So if you if you go really fast like this, uh, well there's a stage later on when you're kind of doing a polishing maneuver where you can go faster when you're doing a kind of glazing on top of it. But for now laying this on in a nice controlled even pressure sort of slow meditative way is the way you have to do it i guess some people really get into french polishing but when you have to french polish a lot of guitars like if you're making them to sell you're building a lot of them man it's a lot of work i kind of wish i had a kid that could you know do some of it i guess i'll have to find a kid and train them to do it but this is the, you're getting a lot of reflection and there's hot spots because I'm working under a, I'm working under a spotlight so I can see what I'm doing. But that's the back of the guitar. These are the sides. That's the front. So it's just a process of making sure that you get the edges covered and sometimes there's little in the purfling, sometimes that you might have a little seam that needs to be filled with like a filler, like some, uh, you know, a lot of people use super glue actually and just touch up some little micro cracks in the purfling or little seams that you know, didn't quite make it small stuff so you have to go over it like square centimeter by square centimeter and make sure that you get everything absolutely like you you will look at every square centimeter of this thing when you're finished with a successful french polish job 
And some people say, oh, it takes 200 hours. But it doesn't take 200 hours. You just have to get good at it. But um, I don't really keep track of the time because I'm afraid of... Uh, I mean, you'd find out that you're making like 50 cents an hour or something. I mean, yeah. <laughs> guitar making is just, you know, it's ridiculous. And it's obsessive. But it's worth it if you make a good one. But this is how you French polish. If you are wondering what people are referring to by French polishing, it's um, shellac. Oh, you can't really see it. It's shellac and then a squeeze bottle. You put some of this on this pad. This pad is muslin and it has a wool uh, core inside of it. So this is muslin wrapped around wool, which I think is pretty good. And then when it gets a little bit dry on the inside, you have to put a little, you have to wet it with a little alcohol to keep it juicy. And then you, people use different kinds of oils to lubricate it. Some people use walnut oil. I used to use walnut oil, but um, once the guitar, once the pores are all sealed with shellac, you can actually use mineral oil on top of it because the mineral oil is not going to soak into the wood. But many people start with walnut oil because walnut oil is a drying oil and even if it gets in the wood, it will eventually dry. But um, the way that I begin the process so that I don't have to do that is I take a piece of cloth and I, I fold it into a square. And then I dip or wet the edge with shellac and make it into like a squeegee. And then you can actually, in the beginning stages, you can actually paint the shellac on just like that using this as like a squeegee brush. And you can cover up the whole guitar like that. And then you come back and you use oil and thin shellac and alcohol. And you make a, you make a kind of... Uh, mixture on the pad that evaporates and when you're doing the figure eight movements on the pad the pad gets flat you start covering the whole guitar 20 or 30 minutes later you've actually redistributed all that shellac that you painted on if there are any ridges or anything you've you've actually kind of redistributed all and made it like glass because of the way that you um can manipulate the surface with the pad and the friction of the pad and the evaporation of the alcohol. The alcohol will evaporate and uh, it will, while it's evaporating, it will also get into the layer layers underneath where you're working and soften them up and blend them into with what you're working on now. So it unifies all these separate layers that you're putting on and turns them into a glassy plate on top of the wood. Some people start by putting walnut oil all over the guitar and then they put shellac and, on, and oil on the pad and then they s sort of like squeeze the walnut oil out. I know someone, my teacher did that, but I don't, I don't like doing it that way. My teacher was actually kind of famous for doing it that way. And... Um, I have to say though, it does give, when you put the walnut oil on it, since the walnut oil is a penetrating drying oil, uh, it really gives the French polish a very deep kind of look, especially on spruce. But I don't like to do it because um, I don't really think that uh, it needs to be done. And I think that the walnut oil takes a really long time to just really dry. And it takes a UV light to really get the walnut oil to dry. So I don't do it. Eventually it will dry on the, in, on the inside. And it dries, you know, it dries rapidly in a few days. But really to get it to dry and chemically change, it really takes a lot of time and some UV light. And um, I just don't think it's a necessary process. My teacher ins insisted on it. 
but um, it's not my that's not my bag. I kind of modified modified what he taught me how to do with uh, lessons from another person. He was a prof another professional French polish guy. Uh, so anyway, that's that's what we are doing. Let's see if we can get the light off of it. You can see this is chiricote. It's a word from I believe it's like from Central America. It's a really gorgeous uh, back and side uh, combo. It's slightly, it, these pieces of wood are from the same flitch. That means they're from the same, uh, they're from the same board. When the, when the board is sawn and the, and the pieces are sitting consecutively next to each other, when the board is ripped into, into thin strips, that's called a flitch. So the, 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 the boards, you know, you, you have a thick board and you saw it and then this piece peels off and this piece peels off and this piece peels off. So these were flitch mates, these two pieces. And you can, you can see it here in the end. You can see the, it, they match. But this wood was so hardcore, the grain was so hardcore moving in the wood that just within the space of cutting the wood and the kerf of the saw blade, which I, I think these pieces were a little on the thick side, but just within that, there was enough distance between the markings in the wood to create this effect that these pieces don't, don't look like they quite match, but they actually do. And the back is also a match, but they're offset. And I did it intentionally to avoid some cracks, but I'm actually really, really happy with the way it turned out. Because you see there's a black mark here and there's a black mark here. These, are, these would normally line up and be book matched, but there were some problems, like in some other part of the wood where the wood was substandard and I didn't want to use that part of the wood. So what I did is I just moved them a little bit apart and it made this it made the set work instead of wasting like these sets are very expensive I'm not going to tell you how much but they are pricey um, so what I ended up with is a really beautiful asymmetrical back of wood that basically matches so you see this incident over here there's a little there's a little um, uh, residue or not residue there's a little bit of indication of this thing over here there's this mark here it corresponds with this mark here but this is yeah and and down here they correspond if you if you really look carefully you can see where they correspond but this is wood it's like it's a tree it's not made by machine this is an organic thing and the the this this is one of the most beautiful backs I think I've ever made because I matched it that way. It just really appeals to me. I'm I'm super happy about this. I I guess you can tell. And then in order to make it work, I had to put this piece, this uh fillet piece in between them. And this is a piece of wood that's from Kyushu in Japan, and I forgot the name of the I forgot the name of the species. I can put it in the description. Uh, but I have a whole bunch of this stuff. And I also use this wood as the binding for this guitar. I wish I could remember the name of it. It's a Japanese name. But this wood is... Um, it's like similar to a very, very dark... It's like a, it's like a combination between a rosewood and cherry. Uh, that's how that, that's how I describe it. It's like halfway cherry, halfway rosewood, but it's a really nice wood, and I have a lot of it. So it's going to end up being um, wood that I'm going to use on, as as binding material on um, on dark guitars. I, I, it's a little bit too light to use on a blonde guitar, but on any dark guitar, this this wood I think is really nice because it it uh, it accentuates the edge of the guitar in a way that's subtle you know um, I like ebony uh, bindings I like black bindings and I like lighter bindings and 
on flamenco guitars, I don't put side purfling on the guitar. It's um, on the on, on the sides. That, in other words, side purfling would be like a little line that's in between the side and in between the purfling. Um, I just don't do it on flamenco guitars. On the classical guitar, okay. But um, flamenco guitars to me should just be like really pared down to the bare elements and just let the wood speak for itself and the lines of the guitar speak for itself. That's just my style. That's the way, also something I got from my teacher that I've carried on. So anyway, I'm getting a little hoarse. So I just wanted to show you the process of French polishing. And this guitar is going to be ready in like a week or two. Thanks for watching.